Story 1. This incident happened when my daughter was about four months old. Let's meet the cast, myself, my daughter, an entitled mom, and her child. Setting, a local coffee shop. One afternoon, after a mommy yoga class, I know it sounds cliché, but it's a great way to meet other moms. My daughter and I went to grab some coffee. Well, I got coffee, and she had her milk. After finishing her milk, she drifted off to sleep. I decided to indulge in a second cup of coffee. While I was sipping my coffee and reading the news, an entitled mother and her child entered the scene. Entitled child, ah, a baby. I smiled but returned to reading my news and enjoying my coffee. When I glanced up again, the child was attempting to pick up my sleeping baby. I panicked, of course. Me? No, no, no. Entitled mother. Oh, she wasn't hurting her. Entitled child. I want to hold the baby. Me? She's sleeping, and you're too little to hold her. Honey, she's heavy. Entitled mother. Just let her hold her. My kid is very mature. Me? She's not a baby doll. No. Entitled mother. You don't have to be so rude. Me? Excuse me? At this point, the child tried again to pick up my baby, waking her up. My daughter began to cry, so I picked her up to comfort her. Me. Now look what you did. Leave us alone. Entitled mother. She just wants to hold your daughter. The entitled mom reached to grab my baby. I instinctively turned to protect my daughter, keeping her out of reach as she cried. Entitled mother. Just let her hold her. She kept trying to grab my baby. Me? Help! In my panic, I open-handedly punched her in the nose. By this time, the coffee shop employees stepped in, pulling the entitled mother away. One of them mentioned they had called the police. The entitled mom's nose was bleeding, and her child was sobbing. I felt bad for the kid because she was little, but the mother should have known better. The employees asked us both to stay and wait for the police. Entitled mother. Good. She assaulted me and traumatized my child. My baby was still crying, so I went to a corner to calm her by feeding her. Entitled mother, she's exposing herself to my child. This is indecent. I ignored her, focusing on my baby, who eventually calmed down. When the police arrived, they took statements from both of us. Entitled mother, she exposed herself to my daughter and assaulted me. I feared I might be in serious trouble. That's not true. She tried to take my baby, and I was just protecting her. Thankfully, the coffee shop had security cameras, and the footage showed everything. The entitled mother was arrested for attempted kidnapping, and I'm scheduled to testify in court next month. Update. The court date for the criminal charges against the entitled mother is set for April 14th. I didn't expect to update before then, but something surprising happened. Cast. Me, a delivery man who wasn't really a delivery man, the entitled mother, and her child. One morning, after taking my baby to the park, we returned home around 11 a.m. There was a man standing on my porch, looking confused. My daughter was asleep in her stroller, so I instinctively reached into my purse for my pepper spray. Me, can I help you? Man, I'm looking for my name. I have a package for her. He held out a thick envelope. Me? I'm her. I can take it. I signed for the envelope, but as soon as I did, the man ripped off his fake mustache and delivery hat, revealing himself as a legal intern. Him. Cool. You're being sued. By the way, good luck. Yes, you read that right, I'm being sued by the entitled mother. The woman who tried to snatch my baby is suing me. What for? Well, apparently, I caused her $25,000 in damages. Inside the envelope was an absurd amount of paperwork detailing her lawsuit. She claims I broke her nose, and she's suing me not only for the related medical bills, but also for a pre-existing nose issue that she now wants fixed. Additionally, she's suing for emotional distress for herself and her child, claiming that her child now has post-traumatic stress disorder from the incident. She also accuses me of slander and character assassination for saying she tried to kidnap my baby. To top it all off, 
She offered to settle out of court if I dropped the criminal charges against her. I took this letter to my lawyer, who assured me the judge would laugh her out of court, especially since the criminal trial is practically guaranteed to go in my favor. So, we'll face each other in court on April 14th for the criminal case and again in July for the civil case. Update. We finally reached the day of the criminal trial, and I can't wait to share the results with my daughter when she's older. The trial took place this Wednesday, and here's how it went. Cast. Me, my husband, the entitled mom, the entitled dad, the entitled child, the judge, the jury, the prosecutor, and the entitled mom's lawyer. Setting, around 9.30 am at our local courthouse. My husband and I had dropped our baby off with his mother. Although I briefly considered bringing my daughter and breastfeeding while the entitled mom was on the stand just to annoy her, I decided against it. Instead, I brought my husband along for support. We took our seats behind the prosecutor and had a brief chat before the entitled mom entered the courtroom with her lawyer. If looks could kill, I wouldn't have made it through the trial. The judge and jury entered, and we were ready to begin. Right as we started, the entitled dad and child entered the room in the noisiest way possible. Judge, entitled mother, you are charged with attempted kidnapping, first-degree assault, disturbing the peace, and disorderly conduct. How do you plead? Entitled mom, your honor, I am 100% innocent. I am outraged that I'm even standing here. I am a proud American and... The judge was clearly unimpressed and cut her off. Please sit down. The entitled mom stuttered, but... Now, the judge commanded. She sat down immediately. The prosecutor began with their opening statement, laying out the case and explaining that the entitled mother was a danger to my baby, attempting to rip her from my arms. At this point, the entitled mother started screaming, No, 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 that isn't true. The judge had her lawyer keep her quiet, and the prosecutor continued, explaining that there was clear and indisputable evidence of the entitled mom's guilt. Their opening statement was succinct, wrapping up in about five minutes. The defense's opening statement was about 40 minutes long. The lawyer gave the entitled mom's entire life story, trying to paint her as a typical suburban soccer mom who couldn't possibly be guilty. The judge allowed it, but I could tell he was getting tired of the long speech. By the time the defense finished, the judge dismissed us for the day. On the second day of the trial, my husband and I grabbed coffee from the courthouse cafe when the entitled dad approached my husband. Entitled dad, hey man, how are you doing? Husband, fine. Entitled Dad, this whole situation is crazy. Husband, yup. Entitled Dad, look, man, what will happen to my daughter if her mom goes to jail? It's not good for the kid. Husband, yeah, that's rough. Sorry. Entitled Dad, you could tell your wife to drop the charges, you know, for the kids. Husband, yeah, I'm not going to do that. Entitled Dad, Come on, man, be reasonable. Husband, if your wife was reasonable, we wouldn't be here. Entitled dad, screw you. He then used a racial slur. Husband, get out of here. My husband walked away. The second day continued with a prosecution presenting their evidence, including the security footage and witness testimonies. The defense tried to cast doubt on the witnesses, but it was clear they were grasping at straws. Finally, I took the stand to testify. The defense lawyer tried to twist my words, but I held firm. Defense lawyer, it seems like you were the first to raise your voice. Is that accurate? Me, I suppose so. Defense lawyer, so, you were the instigator. Me, I don't think so. Defense lawyer interrupting, you claim the entitled mother assaulted you. Me, yes. Defense lawyer, did she strike you at any point? Me, not exactly strike. Defense lawyer, did you strike her? Me, yes, but it was to... Defense lawyer interrupting again. The jury will note that this woman admits to being both the instigator and the aggressor. When it was the defense's turn, 
The entitled mother took the stand and told her version of events. According to her, her child had simply complimented my baby, and I responded by verbally abusing her child. She claimed she tried to calm me, but I suddenly grabbed my baby and, in her words, it was very unlikely that my baby was mine. She claimed she was just trying to help. On the third day, we reached the verdict. On the charge of attempted kidnapping, the jury found there wasn't enough evidence to convict. However, on the charges of assault, disturbing the peace, and disorderly conduct, the evidence was clear, and she was found guilty on all counts. Sentencing The entitled mother was sentenced to 18 months of probation, 40 hours of community service, 30 hours of anger management, and $7,300 in fines. While many were hoping for jail time, I'm satisfied with the outcome. This will go on her criminal record, and if she violates probation or fails to complete her requirements, she could face 18 months in prison. We left the courthouse feeling good about the result, and now we're preparing for the civil case in a few months. Story 2 my mother-in-law was battling stage 4 ovarian cancer, and it was rough. We were constantly at the hospital, never knowing if it was going to be a good day or a bad one. On top of that, we had a baby under a year old. Needless to say, taking down our Christmas lights wasn't exactly at the top of our priority list. Now, enter this guy from our neighborhood's homeowners association. This dude, I swear, had nothing better to do than cruise around looking for violations. We kept seeing him on our security cameras, stopping by our house at all hours. At first, we thought something was wrong, like maybe there was an emergency we didn't know about. So, one day, I decided to call the guard shack to find out what was going on. That's when I got hit with this gem. Guard, Christmas has been over for three weeks. You need to have your lights down before the end of the month. Me, excuse me. Is this really what all these visits have been about? Guard. Yes, and if you don't comply, we'll fine you $25 a day for the first week, then $50 each day after that. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I tried to explain our situation, thinking maybe he'd show a little compassion. Me, look, we're dealing with a family medical emergency. My mother-in-law is fighting cancer. We have a baby. Guard. Well, it's not my problem. Take your lights down. That's when my wife, who had been listening in, just lost it. I've never seen her so angry. Wife, are you kidding me? We're dealing with life and death here, and you're worried about Christmas lights. She was on a roll, and honestly, I didn't try to stop her. This guy deserved every word. We decided to take this to the next Homeowners Association board meeting. My wife was ready to give them a piece of her mind, and boy, did she deliver. We walked into that meeting room, and she let loose. Wife, who do you people think you are? We're going through hell, and you're harassing us about Christmas lights. Is this really what our neighborhood has come to? The board members and the general manager looked stunned. They glanced at each other, confused. Board member, I'm sorry, but what are you talking about? We haven't issued any fines for Christmas lights. That's when things got interesting. Turns out, this wasn't even a real homeowners association policy. The guy who'd been hassling us. He worked for the security company hired to man the main entrance guard shack. Get this, he was getting bonuses for patrolling and handing out fines for homeowners association violations. This jerk was just driving around, making up his own rules and fines. General manager. We had no idea this was happening. This is completely unacceptable. My wife and I were furious, but also relieved that the homeowners association wasn't actually behind this. Me, so what are you going to do about this? Board member, we'll be addressing this immediately. This is not how we operate. True to their word, by the next meeting, that guy was fired. And it didn't stop there. When the contract was up in the summer, they hired a whole new security company. Talk about cleaning house. You know, looking back, it's amazing how things can snowball. We were dealing with so much the stress of my mother-in-law's illness, taking care of a baby, and then this Christmas light drama on top of it all. But sometimes, standing up for yourself can lead to positive changes for everyone. 
The best part of this whole story, my mother-in-law, she's been cancer-free for over a year now. After everything we went through, that's the real victory. The Christmas light saga, that's just a story we tell now, about the time we accidentally took down a power-tripping security guard and his whole company. So, if you ever find yourself in a situation where someone's giving you a hard time over something trivial when you're dealing with real life and death stuff, remember our story. Sometimes, speaking up not only helps you, but might just fix a bigger problem you didn't even know existed. Story 3 Let me tell you about the time I lived in a neighborhood run by the most ridiculous group of people you've ever seen. I rented a house there, and at first, it seemed okay. The homeowners association had some normal rules, nothing too crazy. But then I noticed how some board members would strut around like they owned the place, handing out fines for the tiniest things. Now, I wouldn't have cared much if the president and one of the board members didn't live on my street. Their driveways looked like they'd been through a war, but somehow that was fine. Get this, the board member's son worked on his truck and left a massive oil spill on their driveway. They just threw a red towel over it and left it there for eight whole months. But us? We get fined for a few rust-colored streaks on our concrete. The hypocrisy was unreal. One day, I saw the president inspecting my driveway with a magnifying glass or something. Me, can I help you with something? President, just doing my rounds. Your driveway's looking a bit stained. Me, stained? It's barely noticeable. Have you seen your own driveway lately? President, that's not relevant. Rules are rules. Me, but shouldn't they apply to everyone? President, I'll be issuing a fine for this. Have a good day. I was fuming, but that was just the beginning. The real kicker came when they decided to install these monster speed bumps. The old ones were fine, just enough to make you slow down. But no, that wasn't good enough for them. They kept sending out these dramatic notices about speeding. This is not a racetrack, they'd say. Meanwhile, the only accident that ever happened was when a board member's spouse got drunk and crashed into a tree. But sure, let's blame the speeders. So they put in these new speed bumps. Calling them speed bumps is an understatement. They were more like small mountains in the middle of the road. You couldn't drive over them without feeling like your car was about to fall apart. Board member, these new speed bumps will teach people to slow down. Me, they're ridiculous. You can barely get over them at any speed. Board member, that's the point. Safety first. Me, but they're causing more problems than they're solving. People are driving on the grass to avoid them. Board member, then we'll put up barriers. Problem solved. And they did. Concrete barriers, like we were living in some kind of fortress. It was madness. But then, something beautiful happened. Someone and I have no idea who decided they'd had enough. One night, right before garbage day, this mystery hero poured diesel fuel all over those speed bumps. When the garbage trucks came through the next morning. Well, let's just say those bumps didn't stand a chance. You'd think the homeowners association would learn their lesson, right? Nope. They rebuilt those monstrosities, somehow making them even worse. And wouldn't you know it, a week later, our diesel-wielding vigilante struck again. This time, the homeowners association gave up. They yanked out what was left of those speed bumps and just paved over the holes. It was glorious. At the next homeowners association meeting, things got heated. Board member, we demand to know who's responsible for destroying the speed bumps. Resident, maybe if you hadn't made them so ridiculous in the first place, this wouldn't have happened. Another resident, yeah, those things were dangerous. President, we were just trying to ensure everyone's safety. Me, by making it impossible to drive down the street, come on. The meeting went on like that for a while, with residents finally voicing their frustrations. In the end, the homeowners association caved. A few months later, they installed new speed bumps, the normal, plastic kind that bolt to the street, you know, like reasonable people would use. It was a small victory, but it felt good. Sometimes you've got to stand up to the petty tyrants, even if it's just over some speed bumps. 
and whoever you are, Captain Diesel, I raise my glass to you. You might not be the hero we deserved, but you were definitely the one we needed. Story 4 So, a bit of backstory. I'm a veteran who struggles with major depression and post-traumatic stress disorder PTSD. Because of this, my therapist suggested I get a service animal and said she would write a letter to have it designated as an emotional support animal until it could be officially certified. Luckily, a friend of my mom's was giving away three great Pyrenees Catahoula mix puppies, which was perfect for me since I herd and haul cattle for work. Both breeds are known for being herding dogs, and they're very intelligent, happy, and lovable. I thought having one would help me with my work and my PTSD. My puppy, Sadie, is the sweetest and clumsiest little pup ever. Normally, my company lets me bring Sadie with me, and she either rides in my truck or hangs out in the shop with our mechanic's dog. However, my girlfriend usually spends Friday to Sunday at my place, and Sadie immediately bonded with her. The two of them were cuddled up, fast asleep, looking too cute to disturb. I decided to leave Sadie at home with my girlfriend that day knowing she wouldn't mind since she already has a great Dane and loves big dogs. After work, I called my girlfriend to let her know I was heading home. She said she was taking care of the horses, yes. She's a horse enthusiast, but not in the way some people imagine. She had Sadie with her and was just finishing up. Knowing neither of us would want to go out again once we got home, I asked her if she wanted to meet me at the pet store to pick up a service dog in training vest for Sadie. Training her in public was becoming a challenge because everyone who sees her immediately wants to pet her. I figured the vest might help deter some of the attention. Fast forward to us at a large chain pet store, you can probably guess which one, as there are only two major ones. We were letting Sadie pick out some toys and finally arrived at the section with collars and harnesses, which is what we were actually there for. I was fitting Sadie for different harnesses, leashes, and, of course, some cute Christmas sweaters. While I was putting things back on the shelf and joking with my girlfriend, I felt a hard tap on my shoulder. I turned around to see a woman who practically radiated entitlement. She was in her mid to late forties, with long bleach blonde hair tied in a ponytail, jeans that may have fit her two decades ago, and a button-down western shirt. Thankfully, she had an undershirt on because those buttons were doing their best to contain her obviously surgically enhanced figure. This is the type of woman I'd call a Texan soccer mom, but for the sake of this story, we'll just refer to her as Karen. As soon as I started to turn, Karen spoke. It's about time. I've been waiting here for at least five minutes while you've been flirting with this poor woman. Now, my girlfriend hates confrontation and avoids it at all costs. As for me, I tend to use these situations as opportunities to joke around or be a little sassy. My girlfriend knows this, so when we made eye contact, she rolled her eyes at my smile and walked off with Sadie to browse the next aisle. Karen, now even more annoyed, said, Really? You're just going to ignore me? I replied, I'm sorry about that, ma'am. What do you need? Honestly, her rudeness was already getting to me but I wasn't going to be impolite just yet. I need to know where the item is, she said, but I wasn't paying full attention at that point. I had already decided to have some fun with her by sending her on a wild goose chase. Oh, sure thing, ma'am. Go to the end of this aisle, down three, take a left, then a right at the next one, and you'll find it halfway down, I said, or something like that. I don't really remember the specifics, as I was just making it up. Karen took off on her mission, and I walked over to my girlfriend, who was now in line at the only open register in the store. I'm not complaining, it was moving quickly, just setting the scene. Wow, that was fast, she said. Feeling a bit proud, I responded with a big smile. Oh, she just needed to know where something was. My girlfriend, knowing me too well, didn't buy it. Really? That's it? Did you actually help her? Yep. Though I was a bit rude in return, I admitted. At that moment, Karen appeared again, this time with someone I assumed to be the store manager. She cut into my conversation, saying, That's him right there, and he's still harassing this poor woman. I want him fired immediately. He gave me wrong directions to aisles that don't even exist. 
just so he could continue flirting with this woman. I turned to my girlfriend, who was visibly annoyed with me, and said, What? Giving her wrong directions is rude too. Karen, now standing with the manager, just made me smile even more. My girlfriend, clearly unimpressed, tried her best to ignore the situation. The store manager addressed Karen first. Ma'am, I've never seen this man before. He doesn't work here. Then, turning to my girlfriend, he asked, Ma'am, is this man bothering you? With a playful smile, my girlfriend replied, Yes, but no more than usual. Karen then snapped, Then why do you smell like an animal? The manager, remaining calm, said, Ma'am, that's clearly a cow smell. We don't sell cattle here. Realizing her error, Karen turned back to me in frustration. You don't work here. Why didn't you just tell me? Why didn't you just ask? I replied. That's no excuse. It would have been much quicker if you had just told me, she exclaimed. Yes, but it wouldn't have been as fun, I said, smiling. Maybe next time you'll be more polite when speaking to a worker or a stranger. At this point, Karen was practically screeching. Where do you work? I'll call your manager and report you. And she even admitted that you bother her all the time, so I'll report you for stalking too. We were next in line, and I didn't want to stay and argue, but what she said made me laugh out loud. Lady, I don't know who you think you are, but let me make a few things clear. One, I don't, nor have I ever, worked in customer service. My boss wouldn't care if I was rude to some random woman. Two, you shouldn't be rude to anyone, regardless of their job. Everyone deserves respect. And three, I don't know what your obsession is with me flirting with my girlfriend, but even if I were single, I certainly wouldn't be interested in flirting with you. I'm happy to help you find someone more age-appropriate, though. What are you, 55? Yes, I know that last comment was a bit of a low blow, but at that point, she had made it personal by accusing me of stalking, even though she didn't even know my name. My girlfriend, who had paid by now, was doing her best to get us out of there quickly. Karen, her eyes wide and mouth agape, began shouting obscenities as we walked toward the exit. She followed us into the parking lot, still yelling, with the manager in tow since she hadn't paid for anything. My girlfriend was starting to visibly shake, as she really doesn't handle confrontation well. I helped her into the car, loaded the bags into the trunk, and the entire time, Karen was still yelling and blocking me from backing out by putting her shopping cart behind my car. At this point, a few things happened simultaneously. First, I got into the driver's seat and started to close the door. Second, Karen tried to stop me by grabbing the door. Third, the door closed on her hand. Fourth, she screamed like an injured rabbit. Fifth, I opened the door to free her hand, and she pulled it away quickly. But instead of walking away, she tried to block the door again, this time with her knee. I couldn't believe it. She was determined. I'll give her that. This time, the door didn't close all the way, but I was frustrated, so I slammed it shut. It must have been painful for her. Now, I was laughing again not because she got hurt, but because when I looked back to inform the manager that she might need assistance, I saw him already halfway back to the store with her cart. The absurdity of the whole situation was too much. At this point, my girlfriend was crying and clutching Sadie tightly. I made sure no one else's body parts were in the door, then backed out carefully, avoiding Karen, though I'll admit the temptation was there. It's been a week now, and I half expected to receive a summons or a letter from a lawyer, but nothing has happened so far. That's fine with me because I don't think I can get in trouble for accidentally injuring someone while they were trying to stop me from leaving. While I don't feel bad about anything that happened to Karen, I do feel terrible for putting my girlfriend in that situation. I've apologized at least a hundred times this week, and we're good, but I know I'll need to be on my best behavior in public for a while. Story 5 Back in the 90s in the UK when students were in their final years of secondary education, or as it's commonly referred to, the General Certificate of Secondary Education Years, schools implemented something called Workplace Experience. This was a two-week program where students would go and experience what it's like to work a job after leaving school. 
even at the time, I found it quite pointless for several reasons. In my case, I couldn't find a placement that would accept me, so the school had to step in and find one for me. I wasn't the only one who needed the school's help with this, either. The school eventually found me a placement in the office of a specialized mechanics education school. Essentially, it was a mechanics shop, but the people working on vehicles were students who were training to get their qualifications in mechanics. While I was there, I wasn't given much to do. It was clear they didn't really want me there, so I ended up doing menial tasks. I delivered documents to offices next door, fetched coffee, used the franking machine, and did other small jobs. It felt like I was just being handed tasks they didn't want to do themselves. But, to be honest, most of the jobs were simple and easy except for fetching coffee from the staff kitchen. There was a tiny room called the mail room. It wasn't very big I could stand in the middle and touch all four walls. There was a desk attached to the wall with a shelf above it holding mailing bags, along with the usual supplies you'd expect in a mail room. In the middle of the desk sat a franking machine with two baskets on one side one for first class postage and the other for second class. For those who don't know what a franking machine is, I'll explain briefly. When you receive mail and see printed markings instead of a stamp in the top right corner, that's where a franking machine comes in. Businesses buy postage in bulk from Royal Mail, and the machine prints the postage details on the envelopes instead of someone having to manually stick stamps onto each one. It makes the job faster. Now, onto the story of my compliance. I was taught how to use the franking machine, which was already pre-programmed. My job was to select whether to print first class or second class postage and then slide the envelope into the machine. The machine would take the envelope, print the postage, and pass it through. But there was something quirky about this machine. Sometimes it would pull the envelope slowly, and other times it would yank them out of my hand and shoot them across the desk, but always with the postage printed perfectly. One day, I was told, go do the mail, so I did. I slid the first envelope into the machine, but this time, something new happened. The machine sliced the envelope open as if someone had used a letter opener. I took the envelope to my boss. The conversation went something like this. Boss, what do you want? Surely you haven't finished the mail already. Me? No, I've barely started. Boss, then go and finish it. Me? I can't. There's a problem with the franking machine. Boss, there's always a problem with it. Just go back and finish the mail. Me, but it's slicing the envelopes open. I tried to show her the damaged envelope. Boss ignoring the envelope. Just frank the mail, will you? Or is that too difficult for someone learning how businesses work? Me, okay? But it's not my fault if something bad happens. So, I went back to the mail room. On the way, I grabbed a piece of paper and wrote a note explaining that I apologized for the damaged envelopes, that the machine was slicing them open, and that my boss refused to listen when I tried to report it. Then, I proceeded to feed envelope after envelope through the machine. Each one came out with a neat slice. I must have processed a couple hundred envelopes for first-class postage alone. Once I finished, I didn't put the envelopes into mailing bags. Instead, I neatly stacked them next to the machine with the note on top. About half an hour before the end of my shift, someone came into the office carrying a few of the sliced envelopes and my note. I quickly learned that he was the boss of the entire business, the person at the top. He had apparently gone into the mail room with a few of his own letters for franking and discovered the pile I had left. After a heated argument with my boss, in which I was blamed for snooping through the mail, I volunteered to show them what had happened. My boss and her superior reluctantly agreed, so I grabbed a sheet of paper from the nearest fax machine and put it in a fresh envelope. I asked the big boss to seal it to confirm that it was properly closed. I then led both of them to the mail room, at arm's length, so they could both watch. I gently fed the envelope into the machine. Sure enough, the machine sliced the envelope right open. At that point, my boss tried to scold me for not telling her, but I reminded her that I had tried, and she hadn't listened. 
I had only followed her instructions. In the end, I wasn't punished. The next day, the franking machine was unplugged, and nothing got posted. The day after that, I found piles of postage stamp books waiting for me to stick onto envelopes manually. When I returned for my second week, I was shown how to use a brand new franking machine. It was a dream to work with, like upgrading from a car that was falling apart to a brand new one with barely any mileage. Even though I continued to be given menial tasks, my boss never ignored me again. A few years after I left school, that business shut down, and the building was taken over by a major tire company that also offered vehicle inspections, alignments, and other services.